Executive Director of the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third in our Astro 2020 virtual series of events. The CASI Astro 2020 conference originally was to have been held in June in Toronto, as, as many of you will know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 necessitated a change in plan. And so we've arranged with many of the authors whose abstracts had been accepted into the technical program of Astro 2020 to participate in these online sessions. The sessions are being run essentially as they would have been during a typical on-site conference, uh, which is to say, there'll be a moderator of the session. Um, there will be a number of PowerPoint presentations. Um, there will be questions and answers invited and discussion. Today's 90 minute event is on guidance, navigation and control. And it features four presentations and the session will be moderated by Dr. Phil Ferguson. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Dr. Ferguson, he is uh, the NSERC Magellan Aerospace Industrial Research Chair in Satellite Engineering, also Director of Star Lab, and an Associate Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the Price Faculty of Engineering at the University of Manitoba. Is there any time left in the session? <laughs> if we can, <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a, whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of credentials uh, for Phil. And we're very grateful for him to, um, to be moderating this session. Uh, Phil, by the way, is also the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute um, journal, CASJ. Uh, so we're working, I'm working personally, I'm having the pleasure of working with Phil to, uh, to restart uh, the peer-reviewed version of that journal. And uh, I'm hoping that those of you who are out there in uh, Etherland might be interested to submit an article to the journal, which is a whole other topic that uh, we'll be happy to discuss um, at some other time with those of you who are interested. Um, so today the presentations um, will be followed or, or even interspersed with questions and comments from you uh, in the audience. And we strongly encourage you to participate. Um, I think all of you have logged on using the URL and you're using your desktop. Um, so, um, those of you who are doing that will see that there's a chat button somewhere on your screen, probably in the lower right hand corner. And uh, when you, if you have a question or a comment, just select that and address your comment or your question to everyone or to all so that um, everybody knows what everybody else is, is uh, interested in or questioning. And that way um, we can already consolidate some of the input that Phil as moderator uh, will be receiving and he'll be marshalling all of that input and directing it to one or the other of the of the speakers today. Um, so uh, also assuming the necessary permissions are received by the presenters today, Cassie will post a video of the session for the benefit of those who could not attend uh, today's event. So that's it for housekeeping announcements and now I would like to hand off to Phil to begin the session. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to this session. Uh, I first want to uh, apologize for me not being able to turn on my video today. Um, with, the, with the pandemic and the different uh, regulations going on at the University of Manitoba, I'm, I'm forced to work from home. And uh, I'll, I'll also, you know, I'll, I'll take this minute to plug SpaceX and say that I join most of, I think, the um, community in rural Canada that can't wait for better satellite internet services. <laughs> and so I, I, I'd like to throw a shout out to uh, Elon Musk and say, uh, let's get on with your, um, uh, with your network of satellites. It's gonna help us all get internet in rural Canada. Um, so uh, I, again, I wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, I'm really excited about this session. As, as many of you know, guidance, navigation and control is, is my uh, area of research. And it's an area that I think Canada in particular is very strong in um, as evidenced by um, the talks that we have lined up today. Uh, we have talks today that are going to span uh, a broad uh, array of different uh, topics that range from um, uh, drones and uh, 
satellite denied uh, satellite denied environments and even using drones for developing new guidance, navigation, and control technologies. So, uh, but enough from me. Uh, I want to uh, first get things started with our first um, uh, presenter. Our first presenter is Mozan uh, Rostami from uh, Ryerson University. Uh, and they will be giving a presentation today on the development of an enhanced ground air control station equipped with an advanced virtual reality headset for stratospheric airship applications in satellite denied environments. So we're looking forward to that. And with that, I would like to ask that uh, Motion share their screen and uh, get started. I, I guess uh, <coughs> one, one final thing that I'll say just before Motion gets started is that uh, if there are questions, I'd ask that you put the questions into the chat window. Uh, I will be monitoring the chat window. And then once Motion is done with his presentation, we will uh, go back and I'll read out the questions as they come in and uh, we'll execute the questions that way. But we'll let Mozen finish, go, go right through his presentation uh, uninterrupted. So take it away, Mozen. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. So can you all see my screen now? OK, perfect. So. Um, this is uh, Mohsen Rostami from uh, Ryerson University. I'm a PhD student and I'm doing my PhD program at Ryerson University under supervision of uh, Professor Jun Chang. The project that um, I would like to talk about today and share uh, some of the outcomes and current uh, uh, actually developments that uh, we have had so far is uh, about a project we have from Ryerson University with uh, a company called uh, Columbia. Uh, MyTax is also supporting our project. Uh, the title is uh, as uh, um, as you can see here is uh, enhanced ground air control station equipped with an advanced virtual reality headset for satellite uh, denied environment, specifically for stratospheric applications. The contents that uh, I will be covering uh, can be seen here. Uh, in the beginning, I'm going to talk about the uh, importance of uh, high altitude platforms and uh, why they're uh, using these days. Uh, currently, uh, we are calling uh, operational altitudes beyond than 65,000 feet, uh, feet as uh, high altitude uh, um, actually operational altitudes and uh, the platforms that are uh, being designed for uh, these altitudes are mainly used for uh, communication services and some uh, military purposes but uh, our, our uh, focus will be mostly about the communication purposes. Uh, these platforms are able to stay at uh, these altitudes uh, for uh, long times say months or even years, some of the uh, platforms. Uh, the work uh, that is being done, and the main reason for this work uh, has been that uh, the company uh, is looking uh, for a ground control station for the platform that they have for their uh, high altitude station work. Uh, the importance of this uh, ground control station uh, is that it can be used uh, either on the ground by the operators on the ground or by pilots while uh, they are losing their connection with uh, satellites. So we are calling this uh, situation as satellite denied environments and uh, they can use it for these purposes and connect to the uh, high altitude platform uh, which is providing the communication uh, system there. As you know, uh, we have different types of ground control stations. Some of them are stationary with uh, different purposes. Uh, but currently, we are seeing some portable ground control stations in the market as well, uh, which, as you can see in the right hand side, what I have uh, the first uh, picture is showing a stationary ground control station. Uh, and the second one 
um, which is mostly used by the drone companies and the small drone uh, uh, users. Uh, it's called portable gun control stations. And the third pi picture that I have here on the bottom, uh, it's uh, what, what we are calling FPV goggles, which are somehow a VR, uh, a virtual reality based uh, ground control station that can do the job of the uh, popular ground control stations without the need for those large infrastructures. And uh, the good thing about them is that they're portable, small, and much less expensive. They can be used in remote, remote locations and remote zones, which, uh, which makes them a great choice uh, for us to use in Canada. The project that we have defined is to develop an enhanced portable ground control station, which is equipped with uh, an advanced virtual reality head-mounted display and the main usage will be for long range application. As I mentioned, there are some FPV goggles in the market, but most of them are for uh, are not uh, being used for long range applications. And uh, that's where uh, they have this uh, lack actually right now. So uh, one of the focus uh, that we have is to develop this uh, type of grand quarter stations. And the second thing is that we want to come up with uh, a platform that can be not only be used by the pilot at the end, but also to be used for training purposes. So the operator or the pilot who will be using this platform from the beginning of training to the end will be using just a United uh, platform uh, to make the entire uh, operation much more consistent for them. So different phases have been defined for this project. The first phase uh, has been more focusing on the simulation uh, part of the work and have the simulation environment on the VR headset. The second phase of the project is gonna be more talking about the experimental work for low altitude cases and then for high altitude uh, scenarios. And the last phase of the project will be discussing about the fleet management system and somehow performing uh, swarming flights uh, at high altitudes using the uh, management, uh, the fleet management system and actually the ground control station that have been developed uh, a bit us. Now, uh, turning to the works that have been done so far, over the phase one of the project, we have developed a flight simulator for uh, the company based on the uh, airship model that uh, they provided to us. Uh, so the development of the flight uh, simulator have been done, uh, has been done in uh, Flight Gear Flight Simulator 2. We have defined different uh, subsystems and required informations for the specific airship that they provided to us, including the aerodynamic forces, uh, the buoyon forces, added mass, and all the information that has been required for this uh, particular uh, platform. And then we bound the uh, radio transmitter that uh, has been used by the company for their uh, tests. So the same radio transmitter, which is called FR Sky Trans Transmitter, have been uh, used and bound uh, with the flight gear flight simulator that have been developed by us. Uh, that was the first part of the project that uh, we have been dealing with. Uh, in the meantime, we needed to uh, add some experimental work to the uh, content of the information that we have received from the company. So uh, those information, which were mainly about the uh, propulsion system uh, has also been added to the uh, flight gear flight simulator to make it more uh, accurate. Although still uh, we are dealing with this and we're trying to make it uh, more accurate and make it more close to the uh, actual case, but that has been the work that uh, has been done by us from Ryerson. So after having the initial uh, flight simulator platform, we were trying to bound everything and integrate the uh, flight simulator, the radio transmitter, with the virtual reality goggle that uh, we uh, took from the market 
which is an Oculus Quest uh, virtual reality goggles. So we have tried to connect them all together and come up with a united system that can do the visualization of uh, simulated environment uh, flight. For that, we uh, needed to uh, actually um, use different uh, applications and uh, some embedded codes uh, to have uh, all information uh, required for the uh, visualization of the flight in, on the VR headset. Uh, first of all, in order to have access to the uh, flight visualization, we have used Visual Des Desktop application, but uh, this application is not an open source application and uh, we, we needed to uh, use the embedded code in parallel with this uh, application to be able to have the 3D information of uh, the radio transmitter and the flight deck that you can see on uh, top right hand side of uh, this slide. Uh, so we actually defined the flight deck and also the Sol uh, SOLIDWORK model of uh, the radio transmitter that uh, we wanted to uh, be used for this project and then integrate all this uh, information using the visual desktop application side quest and uh, unity to via Wi-Fi we could have the um, real-time visualization of all information while uh, we were trying to simulate the uh, flight uh, environment. In the next slide, I'm going to show uh, the uh, current version of the flight simulator that uh, and the view that uh, we can see from the uh, virtual reality uh, head-mounted display. So as you can see here, what I have, uh, what I have in the uh, background, is uh, the head-up display that can show us all uh, required information, including the altitude, latitude, longitude of uh, the aircraft operation, as well as the uh, different uh, required information from the uh, commanding uh, radio transmitter. That, uh, as I mentioned, it was. Uh, uh, it was uh, an FRS Sky radio transmitter. So all functions have been defined. And uh, while we're doing the uh, flight uh, simulation in the uh, simulated environment, we have uh, the real time uh, information from the uh, flight uh, visualization, as well as the information required for the commanding uh, tra radio transmitter and uh, other required information. So everything is in real time manner so far. And uh, the delay was not that much to be worried about for now for the simulated uh, environment that we had so far. Um, what is next and what we are currently dealing with is to uh, reach the uh, low altitude tests and bound the uh, subsystem that we have with, an low, with a low altitude platform and then go for the high altitude uh, platform that will be uh, provided by the company. So uh, for that, we started uh, to have the same uh, radio transmitter and the same camera that will be used probably by the company for a high altitude uh, purpose. So uh, we are trying to bind the uh, radio transmitter with the drone, with a typical drone and also the uh, camera and uh, have the initial ground control station for the actual flight this way. I'm going to show the, uh, another test that have been done currently for the uh, binding of the uh, radio transmitter and the uh, drone for our low altitude uh, tests. So due to COVID, uh, some of the works we had to do actually at our own places, but still the project is ongoing and we are trying to just uh, be in touch with uh, each person who is uh, participating in this project. So yeah, that was 
another part of the project that we have done so far for low altitude uh, tests, what, what is uh, planned for the next steps is mostly about the camera integration with this uh, drone, which we are currently dealing with that. And after that, hopefully uh, in 2021, we are going for the phase two and phase three of the project, which in the next slide, I will more going in depth of the works that uh, we are planning to do and uh, some of the challenges that we might uh, have and we are expecting to have there, uh, which will be mostly about the high altitude tests and uh, some kind of real time communication tests and swarming information flights. For phase two, which will be uh, the development of the GCS uh, for the low altitude and the high altitude actual flight, we are expecting to uh, have our mission control system uh, with the camera that uh, I showed you and uh, have the real-time flight visualization and get the information from flight and display everything on the VR headset using the same uh, head-up display or flight deck that I showed for the uh, simulated environment, having the same thing for the actual flight with the background of the camera um, streaming the uh, flight at the same time while they're all connected to the same radio transmitter that uh, have been used so far and are being used by the pilots from the company. For the uh, phase three of the project, which uh, will be mostly about the uh, swarming uh, flight formation, we are expecting an autonomous operation, which uh, for that we will require to develop our own uh, computer vision algorithms or use the existing ones and enhance them to uh, try to uh, uh, do the uh, obstacle and object detection and uh, recognize the size of uh, the size orientation and motion of the objects that will be seen there. And uh, also, as uh, here we are talking about the uh, swarming flight formation, so uh, the arrangement of each airship will be very important for us. And uh, actually, the maintaining the parent-child concept, having one uh, airship as uh, as the parent and the other ones as uh, the child to follow the um, parent uh, airship would be of interest there. Mm. So different uh, techniques will be used to assure uh, that we have, uh, uh, we can minimize the accidents uh, and enhance uh, the traffic and operational capabilities, which uh, somehow would end to an autonomous virtual air traffic control management system uh, that uh, we're expecting to reach by the end of phase three. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, all that I wanted to share with uh, you for today. And these are the references I have used. Now I can take your questions and uh, see. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. Uh, we do have, um, we have one question lined up right now from our audience. Uh, it comes from uh, Rachel Alorsa. And so the question is, uh, what range of communication latencies are you expecting under real-time conditions? And how will you manage VR sickness while transmitting delayed data to the HMD? First of all, for the first question, uh, I guess what we were expecting was less than three seconds. Uh, if I'm correct, that, that's what I remember right now from the uh, notes that we had uh, in our text for the proposal. And how will you manage your sickness while transmitting delayed data to the HMD? Uh, well, as uh, we are currently using Wi Fi and uh, to transmit all information that we are receiving from the uh, even simulated environment and the uh, VR headset. And the delay was uh, acceptable. And as you saw in the uh, for like the visualization that I showed from the simulator work, uh, it, it was in the range that we were expecting. But what, what we are actually uh, more worried about is about the uh, actual flight that uh, the camera delayed uh, that will happen there. What uh, we, 
this is what we are expecting to have some challenge there. And uh, we are mainly relying on Wi-Fi for now. If it was about low altitude, we could talk about 5G, but as you know, above 30,000 uh, feet, we don't have the 5G uh, availability or 4G availability. That's also an issue for us. There are some uh, techniques that uh, we have been studying. Mm, I don't remember exactly the name, but uh, there are some other techniques that uh, we are expecting to use them actually for the high altitude case. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions here now. Uh, we'll give people a minute here if they wanted to um, jump in. I, I guess I, I've got a question then if, uh, if we've got a little bit of time. So what, what do you see as, as the next biggest technology growth area in uh, along the areas of uh, virtual uh, virtual reality. I mean, we've seen a lot of advances in the past of virtual reality. What do you think our next big milestone is likely to be in this area? Well, uh, the thing is that uh, like uh, when we had the uh, smart mobile phones in the beginning, it suddenly took the um, interest of everyone and we saw it everywhere that everyone was using it. I, I think similar thing will happen there. Maybe not uh, just like this uh, large, uh, the, the uh, large virtual reality at mantle displays, but like uh, glasses that uh, we are seeing outside. I, I'm expecting something like that gonna come out very soon. And later might be lens uh, replace this and everything might be much more interesting in this way. Even in the movies, if you- Okay, very good. Yeah, you can see most of them. Excellent, okay. Well, if uh, there aren't any other questions, then I'd like to uh, virtually thank our uh, presenter here. This is where we would have a big round of applause. So, I mean, I will, will clap. I know you can only hear me right now, but uh, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, we can move on to our second uh, presenter. Uh, our second presenter is uh, Abulassad El Gamoudi uh, from Ecole de Technologie Supérieure. Uh, his talk will be on robust UAV tracking using LEO satellites, uh, TDOA, FDOA measurement under uncertainties. So please join me in welcoming uh, Abul Assad. So you can uh, go ahead and share your screen. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see? Hello, everyone. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Yep, did looks you, good. Do you hear? Okay. Can I start? Hello? Yes, you may start. <clears throat> looks good. Hello, everyone. In the beginning, I would like to thank all for attending today. I am very happy to have this chance to present my work. Before I start my speech, let me introduce myself. My name is Abul Sadi Gamudi. Uh, uh, I teach the student under uh, supervision Professor Rene Langri and co supervisor of uh, Dr. Hamza Ben Zarouk. So uh, today I, I will share with you my presentation titled uh, Robust UAV Tracking Tracking Leo Satellite Using Time Difference of Arrival, Frequency Difference of Arrival Measurements Under Uncertainty. So, in fact, my presentation is divided into six parts, uh, objective and overview objective, and my contribution will be introduced in the introduction. And also the second one will be uh, propo uh, problem formulation. Uh, proposed approach will be third one, and uh, to explain with the, uh, with the approach that I have, and also performance validation, simulation results and analysis, Finally, will be conclusion and future work. 
let me start with phase one introduction. Everyone can ask what's the interference or can be asked uh, what's the type of uh, RF, uh, radio frequency interference. As we see from this figure, uh, that's the regular one. It's, the, it's uh, for uh, communication, for the signal, signal from, uh, for example, from a uh, TV signal. And when anyone uh, or anything can make jamming, like you see here, it's the, this the jammer can interfere with the uh, original signal, and we really see this uh, lose every signal, whole signal. So there is many types of the interference. Can you see or the source of the interference? Can see it come maybe from uh, at the station, or maybe come from here, as you can see here, from UAV in the EV system. Or also can see here, for example, this is like for uh, uh, mobile uh, communication for lithium, for example, you can see you can receive the signal from UAV as you see from this slide. So now what's the source of the interference? So there is many sources of the interference for attention interference and non-attention interference. For an, an attention interference, you can see here can, that come from maybe from human error. That installation, local training of training or poor of equipment, and also the equipment failure, and also can see the another uh, type of non uh, interference. That means name it's the attention interference that maybe come from jammer by outlaws. And also, how can to to achieve the accuracy or how can to get because there is many techniques can overcome for the interference. The geolocation and target tracking is the one part of the or one method to geolocate or to know to, or to overlap, overlapping for the interference. So we uh, want to know what the difference comes from. So there is a first you can, uh, can to measure the, uh, the, the interference, the source. There's many uh, methods or many techniques can use, for example, as angle of arrival or time of arrival, also time difference of arrival or frequency of arrival, also frequency difference of arrival, and, and, and so on. And this is some examples you can see here from the, you can see this the, the, the time of angle of arrival and also uh, receive signal speed. And also we can combine two techniques together to get more accuracy and we can and reduce number of so and sources that we need. You can see here, you can, Combine two techniques, time difference of arrival with frequency difference of arrival. You can see here, for example, here in this uh, time difference of arrival, we need at least three sensors to measure or to calculate the source place that receives signal. And also here, you can see we can use at least two uh, sensors to measure the geolocation. And also, how can we optimize the, that uh, measured the geolocation? There's many techniques to optimize the, for example, you can see here, the optimized can use Taylor Sierra's maximum likelihood or lux least square or what in square or genetic algorithm. And also there is a kind of optimize by filtering as you can see the Kalman filter. And you can see this the uh, uh, improvement for that uh, filter until you can see here it's pitch infinity. So here also you can see the, this the block diagram you can first do only receive signal and can make uh, geolocation measurements and also some techniques you can use the optimal uh, optimizing approach and the other one you can maybe use the optimal state that used for uh, that what what were folks in my study. So in my study we'll select from the all you can see we'll use the time difference of arrival combined with frequency difference of arrival and also we'll optimize using calm uh, calm filter which uh, with H infinity in the same time, and also we compare it with the CKF. So here is the main contribution, you can see the main contribution of my study to achieve the accuracy UAV that tracking and location that moving in high speed and large, large rotation, and also to get the algorithm performance under low intensity, and also we consider the as the case study, the Leo satellite constellation in the uh, 72 degree region. That's why we use this uh, one, because the, the 
GPS signals weak in this region. So now let us move to the problem formulation. You can see that we consider three Lua satellites, medium sat, to track unknown RFI in, in circumstances of uncertainty, and also various scenarios was established to locate UAV tracking. You can see it from like, like you see from this figure. So now what's the uh, let's go to uh, proposed approach. You can see here that as we say, uh, there's many scenarios that I see. So at first, you can see from the block diagram, on first, you can use the same parameter with, to calculate the difference of arrival and calculate frequency difference of uh, arrival individually. And after that, we combine two techniques together time difference of arrival with frequency difference of arrival, and we optimize using each infinity with caramel filter in the same time. So here, as you can see, the, the mathematical model that we use, so this, this is the general equation we use the, for the uh, system state and the geolocation measurement. And you can see here the mathematics for time difference of arrival, frequency difference of arrival, and this will hybrid technique for time difference of arrival with frequency difference of arrival. Here you can see this, the, well, this is calm filter. This uh, the, the general algorithm that used for this calm filter. And also here, this you can see this algorithm or equation for h infinity filtering. And for our technique, you can see we combine two techniques or two methods together, h infinity with this calm filter to achieve the uh, good accuracy and uh, high accuracy, I mean, a high accuracy with a high intensity. Now, let's go to how to achieve the performance and validation. You see this from this equation, you can see the uh, facial maximum, uh, I mean, facial information matrix we will calculate to achieve the karma lower, lower bound. With uh, you see here, this uh, this equation with the uh, uh, system state and this for uh, measurement of uh, geolocation. And now we can show you the simulation result and analysis. And from this one, we can see the is the as a real uh, signal or as a real situation that we use for the simulating. And also, this is the parameter that I use for uh, simulation uh, measurements and uh, uh, to check the result. And here, when you see, when you use the time difference for arrival, you can see this interaction with the three satellites, three satellites as the radium satellites, and this is tracking of the uh, filter. See, we can see from this figure here, we use the time difference for arrival. The target tracking, or you can see, we use uh, uh, CK if it's uh, diversing from the target trajectory. This has a green color. And you see, see this the original, or you can see the true trajectory of uh, UIV. And you see this, this one for H infinity, or just a kind of filter. And also, you can see here the, from this figure, this is the performance for. Uh, you see this the target position and target this the for target position and this for target velocity and this the rotation speed. You can see the one you use time difference for rifle, it's so high uh, root mean square error. So when we use the frequency difference for rifle, you can see the the for the trajectory, you can see this almost close, not very well, but uh, it's better than time difference for rifle, and also the performance, it's uh, improvement, and it's better than we use frequent time difference for arrival. Here we can see this from these figures when you use the uh, combined two techniques or for time difference for arrival with frequency difference for arrival. You see this, uh, the target, it's the best we use the together, it's improved. And also you can see the uh, performance, it's the we use the time difference for arrival with frequency difference of arrival, and uh, we use the H infinity. You can see here this from the you go can see CKF, and also we use code check and the filter separate, and we also use combined H infinity with with the code check filter. It's the best tool.
And also from the speaker, we can see with the, because we uh, we improve with use the use uh, uh, GHKF. You see here the, from this one from this figure, we can see this the initialized uh, target tracking, and here this is the true true uh, sorry. It's the true trajectory or UAB, and you see here this the we use the uh, third degree GG uh, with uh, uh, HMVT. It's the, the blue one. It's almost not close, but we use the fifth degree HMVT. You can you can see it's almost follow that one. And also you can see from this performance, we use that third degree. It's it's a little bit high, but it's, uh, we use the HMVT uh, HKF. It's uh, fifth degree. It's uh, very well with when using the uh, under the identity and color noise. Now let us go to talk to conclusion and future work. So we can see here from uh, a serious approach of the target tracking position having proposed to estimate the location and velocity of RF that received from UAV in circumstances of uncertainty, and also the case study considered the Arctic uh, region, 17 degree north, because the GPS signal in that region is very weak. And also from the mathematical model, the techniques and scenarios implemented to uh, it absorbed that all mathematical uh, method of geolocation techniques are complex and high in energy. That's why we use CKF Q, uh, QKF and also combine HKF with QKF to achieve uh, high, and, uh, high linearity and also due to the due to the high speed of high uh, high speed of low satellite we achieve most uh, visibility of Debler shift and also from the multiple test during uh, scenario. It absorbed that in signal technique. So me, I mean, when used uh, time difference of arrival, the worst case, especially with uh, frequency difference of arrival, that is the best case. And also, frequency difference of arrival is the best because the frequency difference of arrival measurements is high speed of Leo satellite. And also, UIV approach both the time difference of arrival measurement is the best compared to the signal measurement combining each infinity with the camera filter was the robust uh, target tracking in circumstances in circumstance of uncertainty. So in future work, creating more scenarios of UAV tracking based on additional geolocation techniques such as angle of arrival, power, dif power difference of arrival, and compare it with a uh, proposed approach, and also consider an error estimation of position and velocity of UAV achieved by each infinity quadrilateral filter with different values of uh, gamma, and also working to improve target tracking estimation with developed filtering in circumstances in circumstance of scenarios with vision infinity, comparing the algorithm comparing the algorithm performance using PCKRLP based on it uh, because it is the more robust tool compared to CRLP. So this is the, my reference that I use. And finally, thank you for attention. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation, and uh, we're happy to have you here. Obviously, so um, I don't see any questions here. We'll uh, open up the floor to if there's any other questions from the audience. Anything? Okay. So there is one. So from Warren. So, um, what were the assumptions with respect to the receiver uh, C and O? Uh, as a and as a follow up, uh, do you need uh, to prime the H infinity QKF 
or does it converge with any initial conditions? And then finally, do you plan to implement the H-Infinity QKF for onboard processing? <clears throat> so would you be repeat the question, please? This is Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in pieces. Uh, I'll, I'll split it up for Warren here. Uh, so his first question is, what were the assumptions with respect to the receiver C and NO? Assumption? Yeah, so the assumptions with, with regards to the receiver performance. Did you make any assumptions about that? No, because we, we proposed the we receive signal as a simulation. We, uh, uh, receive the uh, just for a uh, time we calculate the time uh, time arrival and the frequency develop and we use covariance to calculate that one okay uh so uh, uh warren's second part was uh do you need to prime the h infinity qkf or does it converge with any initial conditions? So I, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you set up your initial conditions and what that convergence behavior looks like. Yeah, we, we start, uh, you, uh, we use the initial, initial values to, calculate, to, to estimate the first one. And after that, we continue the scenario for performance. Okay, and then finally, Warren's question is, uh, do you plan to implement this in, on onboard processing or is this something that you would do offline? Yeah, right now we will use it as offline, but for the future, we plan to use it in the home. Okay, thank you. Uh, Warren, feel free to post any follow-ups there if you have any questions. Um, or if there's any other questions from anybody else in the audience. Um, okay, thank you, Warren. Um, so uh, I've got a quick question. I just wonder if you could speak a little bit uh, about the extendability of this method to planets other than Earth. Uh, as you know, we've uh, on the way to Mars right now is a drone that needs some mechanism for navigating. Uh, we have plans of putting lots of robots and uh, on the moon. And we have challenges moving those devices around on different planets. What, what kinds of challenges do you think this method might be able to help with when we start to extend our, uh, our presence to different planets? And could this be applicable in, in different uh, areas? Yeah, <clears throat> as, as you mentioned now, uh, now because it's difficult to use for uh, to use the as uh, to calculate in the, with some uh, satellite immediately. So uh, we plan to maybe use the, with the drones to as as experimental, and we compare it the, as a real uh, situation. Uh, excuse me, uh, Todd. Can I add a point, uh, some point on, on on this on this question? Okay. Sure. Yeah, as, as I am co-supervisor of, of Abu, uh, just, just to answer your last question, it's very interesting, yes, that, that you ask about space and the space exploration, because uh, what we are doing, of course, Abu is working on simulation, more on simulation, but the last step with other students is to implement this on a software defined radio and fly on drone, okay, using real Leo satellite constellations. And of course, it will be expandable, and this is in our full interest to expand this to space exploration, for example, on Mars, when you will have, for example, only one satellite or maybe two or during a very short period uh, of availability and where you can apply this technique, yes, uh, for sure to, to localize the, for example, the, uh, the robot on the, on the surface or drone flying over, over the surface and, uh, and so on. So yes, it's, it's, uh, it's in our plan to expand these techniques to, uh, to space exploration. That's interesting. It's, it's really exciting and, and very timely given the uh, roadmaps that we and uh, as Canada and, and other countries around the world have for expanding our space exploration uh, beyond Earth. So that, that, that's really great news and nice work. Yep. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other uh, questions here. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, virtually thank our presenter, uh, Abel Assad, and uh, we will move on to our next uh, presenter, also from 
uh, uh, Ecole de Technologie Supérieure. Uh, this is Hamza uh, Benzarouk. Uh, yep. And we'll be speaking on spacecraft, INS, CNS, Pulsar integrated, TDOA positioning, and navigation solution. Uh, okay. It's like, me... it's like I'm your straight man there, Hamza. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm setting you up. <laughs> okay, give me just a few moments. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just a new, new share. What is it? Uh, boop, boop, boop. Oh, just one minute. Give me a second. Up. Oh. Where is the PDF? Okay. Share screen. Yes. Yeah. Here we are. Can you can you see uh, the presentation? Uh, yes, we can. Looks okay. good. Okay. Okay. I will make it in full screen then. Yeah, so I'm Hamza Ben Zirouk. Uh, so I'm uh, a PhD in aerospace instrumentation, and I work as a research, as short, uh, research associate at uh, La Siena Laboratory in ETS, called the Technologie Supérieure. And uh, we are working on different exciting projects related with the signals of opportunity for uh, navigation, for positioning, navigation, and timing. And uh, one of one part of this big project, let's say, and topic is uh, the work presented by Abu previously. And another one very exciting is about uh, what we uh, what we supposed to be uh, probably uh, the most exciting explorative uh, uh, research uh, for, for the laboratory and for me uh, personally, which is related with Pulsar. So the, the presentation today is about spacecraft INS, CNS, Pulsar integrated positioning, navigation and timing. Uh, we, we talk, uh, we, have, uh, we have recently seen a, a lot of uh, attractive uh, works and uh, exciting works on PNT and alternative PNT solutions. So today we speak a bit uh, about, uh, about deep space navigation using Pulsar timing signals with Doppler shift compensation, which we think it's, uh, so it, it has been uh, very well developed during the last uh, decades by a specialist and uh, we, we want to be on board with uh, some contributions. So this is just the start. I hope uh, it will be appreciated uh, by, uh, by the audience and, uh, and by you guys. So, yeah, I will go. Uh, I will go through different points. The multiple sensor fusion, of course, we will speak about deep space navigation technologies. I will. Uh, I will briefly describe the INS mechanization because because in this work, what we what we expect and what we want to do on the Doppler shift compensation is slightly different from what it, it exists, and we have a, a many reference uh, already uh, already solving this this Doppler uh, Doppler shift uh, compensation for for deep space navigation and especially for the Pulsar uh, mathematical model and for the Pulsar navigation system. <clears throat> we'll talk about deep space and the orbit dynamical model because we speak about satellite and uh, on, on orbit, how to determine accurately uh, and uh, during a long period, the position uh, information of the, of, of the spacecraft. Uh, we will speak about the non Gaussian short noise measurement noise because it's a uh, it's something we, we treat in this in this work, and we have uh, processed using uh, more advanced nonlinear filters. And uh, I will also speak about again uh, the robust filtering algorithms, the adaptive Gauss Hermit. Uh, again, uh, I'm sorry if it is uh, you will you will see it twice. So one uh, with Abu and one with me. But it's uh, let's say that theoretically uh, we uh, we have a library of nonlinear filters at the laboratory which we have developed. But we we believe that. Uh, if we show the, the, the Gauss quadratic Kalman filters, it will be uh, significant. It will be very significant, and it will show the, the best performance, near optimal one, when you use a particle filter, for example. So, this problem of pulsar based navigation and the, the integration and the fusion with other sensors on board spacecraft is very exciting, as I said. And uh, there are different way to solve the, the ways, sorry, to solve this problem. Uh, what, what we propose is really to keep what we know very efficient on Earth again. Uh, so we, we, we want to expand what, what uh, the know-how we have developed here for, for space exploration. And, uh, and the good thing with Pulsar is that there are some, what we call the time transfer equations available for all the solar system. That means that for different space missions, we, we could be able to develop new uh, uh, integrated navigation systems with Pulsar timing signals. So uh, I will not repeat, I think I already told, so I'm not read the slides, I just, I, I just explained that, but there is something very important, probably and very specific to the work because we we use the we use the uh, published references in this field. 
using noisy X-ray sen uh, sensors. So X-ray, that means that we, we are talking about X-ray pulsars. So there are other kind of pulsars, but uh, specifically those ones. And the most uh, we found in the literature and uh, from specialists, and uh, most of them are from Professor Sheikh, if I pronounce correctly the name, uh, we're using the, the crab uh, pulsar and other well-known pulsars as well. Uh, in order to uh, develop a positioning navigation. And in some recent works, we also found that they were able to estimate accurately the attitude of the spacecraft. So it's, it's, it's really amazing and uh, promising, way to, uh, pro promising way of research. So the, the X-ray pulsar positioning source, so we talk about the source of signal, okay, with, with the period, with the timing model. And uh, this is the neutron star, which we call the, the, the pulsar and especially the X-ray pulsar. So we, we will receive uh, by using the X-ray uh, detector, the, the signal periodically, and uh, we will treat this uh, information and signal using what we call the epoch folding uh, approach in order to uh, compare and estimate the time of arrival of that signal. Because if we get the time of arrival, we will be able then to develop uh, or to extract and uh, construct the right measurement uh, in order to uh, implement our uh, extended Kalman filter, for example, based on the reference we used, but uh, other kind of more powerful filters. And very important is to mention that we, what we want is really embiased uh, uh, algorithms and uh, a robust algorithm against colored, correlated noise and also non-Gaussian noise. Because what we found in the literature, even if it was not treated and processed, uh, this, this is a part of our contribution because we suppose here that the measurement noise is colored and non-Gaussian. And that's why you will see at the end, uh, we moved to uh, a modification of the standard form of the algorithm we have used. <clears throat> so uh, uh, if, we, if we talk about the X-ray pulsar positioning source, so and based on the reference given below on the slide, uh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, this, is, this design was developed for a spacecraft around Mars orbit. And uh, you have the source X-ray pulsar. So here is very simple concept, I will say, as I, as I explained, this is really the first a uh, trial we, we, we did, and uh, I hope we'll continue uh, deeper uh, in, with the, with more complex situations. But I have to say that uh, it's it's really uh, amazing that we can apply what we know about multi sensors, uh, multiple sensors, networks, positioning techniques, and everything which was presented by Abu could be applied for space exploration. And this is again an additional answer to your question, Todd, uh, at the end. So we could imagine that we have a map of uh, different and the positions. Uh, information of the different X-ray pulsars and that that will form a network in space so that we will always have at least uh, an availability or a visibility from uh, a minimum number of pulsars so that we can maintain a certain accuracy of positioning and navigation for the space mission. So that's why I said it's, uh, it's really exciting. Uh, concerning the IMU integration and the INS, uh, I think uh, I, will, I will not I will not uh, uh, I will not spend too much time on that. But for me, INS is a, 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 something we cannot just uh, leave and uh, and replace. So uh, inertial measurement unit, inertial navigation systems is always always uh, I would say the uh, not I, I don't want to say mandatory, but it's really uh, something we cannot. Uh, leave if you want to develop or design an integrated navigation system. And of course, depending on the quality of the gyroscopes and the accelerometers and also additional sensors for attitude heading reference system, it could be uh, different from an application to other one. And depending also on the time and duration of the mission, we, we should select the right uh, sensors or the right platforms. And I'm speaking about the strap down quality and also the uh, probably the gimbal one. So uh, INS is, uh, is used here because as I explained, we want to do Doppler shift estimation or Doppler shift compensation, but we want to estimate the speed, the velocity of the spacecraft. And this could be also extended and applied to the a robot on the surface, or uh, I would say the, to the, to the, probably to the astronaut as well. We, we could develop such as what we do for pedestrian navigation on Earth. We could think that probably an integrated systems on the suite of spatial of, on, on, of astronaut would be also a, a something, uh, uh, which could be feasible and uh, which we could realize in uh, in the future. So these are the equations of integration. Of course, when we talk about inertial navigation system, we speak about the initialization step, which is really important, and uh, about the integration of position, uh, velocity, and uh, the attitude, which is very very important when we speak about spacecraft on orbit and spacecraft control. 
or UAV flights such as the Dragonfly mission, which is very exciting on, on, uh, on Titan. Uh, I was on a similar uh, uh, even yesterday and today before before the presentation, and it was exciting to see the the plans uh, they, they, they have uh, they, they have made and the advances uh, of that mission. So all these techniques we uh, we can expand to space exploration indeed, and we know that there are different coupling approach, different fusion algorithm and architecture we could use and we could develop and expand, of course, for these kind of missions. So uh, yeah, this is just uh, an artistic uh, uh, image we, we made at the lab. So for this space navigation based on integration of celestial and pulsar attitude and positioning system. And as I mentioned in the reference on the slide uh, before, the analysis uh, was made uh, using uh, the, the autonomous space class, uh, space class sorry, explorer with the sun-centered inertial Cartesian coordinate system. And the orbit dynamical model was simplified, such as is given on, 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 on the slide. And uh, other simplifications were made, in fact, uh, according to the acceleration variation on AX, A, A, Y, A, Z, so that we, we, we had a, a very simple solution to predict the velocity and then compensate it, but at the same time, treat the problem of this compensation at uh, the filtering framework uh, side by using the modification of the standard algorithm in order to take into account the bias, the colorado noise, and also the non-Gaussian noise, which, is, uh, which could uh, appear during the, the photo detection because each photon from the pulsar will be detected individually and should be compensated individually at the same time. So this is the cloud pulsar parameters and the table of parameters we, uh, we use and uh, develop. No, sorry, not develop, but uh, which, we, which we use as a model of a reference. This is the celestial navigation system equations for attitude estimation and attitude observation. So th this is something also uh, taken from uh, references because we think that for position and velocity uh, or for position of the spacecraft, we should use this fusion between Pulsar and uh, INS. But for the attitude itself, we need something like star tracker or celestial navigation system to observe the attitude from another point uh, or from another sensor, even if this will create some other problems, but I think we will be able in the future to, to, handle, uh, to handle this kind of asynchronous measurement. So the Pulsar navigation measurement is based on the time transfer equation, of course, as I said, and on the figure uh, previously shown from Mars, Sun, and the SSB, the solar center, body center. So uh, the, that, that, uh, that's something very important because by using, because uh, is, it, is it okay on the timing or uh, should I go uh, fast? Uh, I think you're doing okay. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the, based based on that uh, diagram, we should have the time of arrival at the, the spacecraft uh, location and the time of arrival at the SSB, and then we could be able to develop a TDY approach in order to, as I said, construct the measurement for the Kalman filter and then observe and estimate the the position of the spacecraft. Okay. So. Yeah, so as I explained previously, and I, I mentioned that uh, using Pulsar could be using only one source, such as I described the, the, the Cloud Pulsar uh, time mo timing model, but we can use different Pulsars or multiple Pulsars simultaneously. And then we should also think about the Pulsar JDOC uh, estimation. So, so, so exactly the, the same way we, we do and we proceed with GNSS on the Earth. So it's really, as I said, exciting to, to think that we can expand this to, the, to this kind of application. And by the way, by the way, we should be able to optimize the trajectory according to the availability of pulsars uh, during the, the, the journey and, and the mission. So it's, uh, it's really exciting to think that we have such perspective in the future. So this is just to mention that. And the non-Gaussian noise environment, of course, we have different models huh, to, to, to model the, the tailed or the non-Gaussian density of probability, which correspond to the, to the noise affecting the measurement. In fact, uh, the, this was described in uh, different publications and they explained that the shoot noise appeared uh, during, the, during the pulsar observation and by the way, should be taken into account, but it, it appeared during a short period of time. But for the specific work, we are really uh, in this in this uh, in this part and we think that we could develop something in this uh, in this area how to treat those non gaussian noise or color of noise simultaneously uh, by using the same channel or maybe by using two different parallel channels uh, by developing some gaussian sum filtering framework for that or maybe going to the mixture between robust framework like hmfini algorithm and, and the gauss hermit quadrature kalman filter for example so it's something uh, it's something we are working on 
So this is the Gaussian mixture noise model we used. It's not so complex. So uh, uh, this is something to start, as I said, and uh, something we want to, 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 uh, to test and analyze and see how performant our techniques could, be, could handle the, this kind of, uh, or this type of noise, uh, especially during uh, uh, space, uh, space flight or during the uh, deep space navigation or during the journey on, on Mars or on any other planet. So the gross, the gross multiple quadratic Kalman filter, of course, we can develop a lot of, uh, we can speak about cubature and quadrature Kalman filters. We can achieve different accuracies, but uh, I mean, specifically the gross element is the, the best quadrature which we could use. And uh, it could be uh, approximately optimal to the, to the, the optical uh, when we use the, when we use the particle filter, for example, and we want to achieve the optimality. So uh, for me, it's, it's the best estimator, but of course, of course, it's only theoretical, unfortunately. And if you ask me about the implementation, that will be another story. So we have to discuss that. <coughs> okay, this is the algorithm and the simulation validation of the CNS, INS, user integrated navigation system. So these are the conditions used, as I said, uh, based on the reference I, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So here we have some, you can see the disturbance. Huh? You, we have uh, extended and centered central difference cubature and Gauss Hermit on one side. And we have the non-Gaussian version, which we modified uh, on, the, on the same figure. So for example, here without any rotation, we can see the perturbation and disturbance caused by the non-Gaussian noise on the measurement here for the roll. And uh, we can see that the other non-Gaussian uh, filters we developed are really maintaining the right angle estimation uh, even even during that uh, uh, non Gaussian disturbance. The same here we can see on the pitch of the spacecraft, for example, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of uh, response could uh, generate this kind of shoot noise on, uh, on, on the spacecraft and on the controller, by the way. And by using this kind of robust uh, fil filters, it, it could be really uh, interesting to see how uh, uh, during very long period, how, how, uh, how it will perform, uh, how it will impact the the space mission. Here we can see the root mean square error because before we saw uh, the two state, but here concerning the velocity and uh, we, we discussed that there is a, a Doppler shift compensation. So the difference in this work, and I didn't maybe, uh, uh, I didn't maybe uh, give uh, enough details in, in the slide, but the difference is really compared to the, to the reference we, we used where they have developed uh, based on the approximation that acceleration are varying uh, at the 10 power minus nine for AX, AY, AZ, and they develop very, very small and simple formulation to uh, predict the velocity and compensate the Doppler shift caused, of course, by the, by the, the speed and the motion of the, of the spacecraft. But in this work, we decided that we will use INS, more accurate inertia navigation system, in order to predict that speed, which we will compensate and at the same time by using the robust filters to, as you can see here, uh, if you use the standard form, you can see upper curves. And if you use the modified, robustified forms, you can see that we can get that uh, nice shape of the uh, uh, mean square error regarding the, the velocity, so the east velocity, north velocity. And we can see also the, the one quality of inertial errors, which is related to the oscillation of, of the error over time. So it's, a, it's, a, it's really interesting to see how, how the estimators are, are performing. So at the end of the observation the conclusion after the analysis of different estimation results based on the quadrature algorithm and the Gaussian sum uh, filtering for different spacecraft navigation states, it appeared that the CNS fields are measured with information fusion with INS represent a good solution for the space autonomous navigation. Indeed, uh, QKFs can perform well when processing CNS and fields are X-ray measurement individually. However, the dual and parallel processing, the proposed Gaussian sum filters outperform clearly the standard navigation, as I explained, and the limitation of the previous method based on HFE methods were expanded to new positioning and navigation performances. At the end, as a perspective for next step, uh, a new hybrid framework between HFE and Gaussian sum uh, framework this time will be considered in, next, in, the, in the next upcoming publications, of course, and by considering uh, much longer space missions and varying uh, vehicles, I'm uh, talking about uh, satellite on Mars, for example, astronaut or rovers on the surface. So uh, that's all, and I hope it was interesting for, for you guys. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Hamza. Uh, nice job. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about uh, what this can mean for our future uh, missions.
So yeah. uh, question here from Warren. So uh, again, it's a multi-part question here, so I'll split it up into bits for you. Uh, is there an existing space-based Pulsar receiver in development? Oh, yeah. Uh, at, at our side, I can, I can say that we started to design uh, something which could be used on the software defined radio, but uh, you, at, at this level, it's not, it's not really, uh, we are not thinking about embed this on UAV. Uh, we are far from that, but because we need a uh, antenna for that on the, on, the, on the roof probably of the laboratory and, uh, and uh, but we are, we are already working on that to answer you, yes. And there are some reference already developing software defined radio for Pulsar time of arrival signal uh, detection and estimation. So yes, it's feasible, it's feasible. And, and you know, I, I, am, uh, I am really excited about uh, Leo signals of opportunity and uh, the core of my work is about that for, for, uh, for embedded systems on aircraft for, for different situations. And I think, I think in the future, why not? You can imagine that we, we could use PNT from Pulsars on board aircraft and that would be, that would be amazing. And not only, not only for that, but we cannot expand to space, of course. But uh, yes, definitely the, my answer is yes. Uh, Pulsar receiver in development uh, is, uh, is something uh, which could be uh, seriously considered, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, what is the measurement sample rate and propagation rate in your simulation? Oh, uh, I sh do not say the, uh, don't give a mistake. I, I would give you, uh, for, for the INS, definitely, yes. For, for the INS was uh, uh, 1000 Hertz for, for the inertial navigation systems. But for the Pulsar, the observation period was uh, 1000 seconds. And the sampling rate between, uh, the, the difference of the sampling rate between the Pulsar and the celestial system for the attitude estimation, for the attitude observation, was from 100 seconds to, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, I, I need to check this. But uh, anyway, uh, yes, it was, it was a sequential measurement uh, based on a long period of observation. And, and that, is why, that is why Doppler compensation is very important in this kind of application because you have to compensate and to obtain the navigation information directly after observing the Pulsar. And uh, this makes uh, challenging this, uh, this problem. So for uh, for the sampling for the sampling rate that was the for the INS I'm sure for the for the for the attitude sensor it was around ten minutes and uh, we had another one at one hundred seconds so th th these are the three but I can I can check and confirm by uh, by, by by email on, on the program because I, I didn't put that on the table so I don't want to make a mistake. Okay. Um, and what uh, what were the natures of the non-Gaussian filters? How large were the standard deviation approximations? Actually, actually uh, I have to say that for this theoretical work, because I didn't find personally and my colleagues uh, a clear uh, a clear measurements or a clear uh, standard deviation or clear variance identified already for the application. So what we did, uh, to be honest, is uh, to make a, a scale of different level of noises uh, by using the, the Gaussian mixture uh, model I shown on the slide. And we, we just started from the uh, lower to the worst case. And we have seen that the, the algorithm and the filters were really performant. So I, we, we don't have really, uh, we don't have clearly uh, identified our real values. So we are waiting for real experience, hopefully to, uh, to have those kind of, uh, of data set. But uh, yes, as I say, this is the first, the first work we have done on this. So uh, hopefully we'll get it soon. Okay, and then uh, Warren's last question here was, did you assume uh, isotropic pulsar signals? Uh, were they evenly distributed, uh, distributed or uh, distributed in some other way? Oh yeah, yeah, that was the assumption. As I said, based on the reference, we, uh, we, we used, uh, it, was, it was assumed to be uh, an isotropic source uh, providing the signal in all uh, in all directions. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, are there any other questions uh, from the audience? Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Continue, Hamza. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. I, just uh, just to mention that uh, this phenomenon of shoot noise is uh, during a short period. Uh, it's 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 uh, and. Uh, that's why probably there is not too much work on that, but uh, I would say it's really uh, interesting to, fo to focus on this problem because uh, uh, for, the, for the future of the space missions and uh, the exploration missions, uh, this should be uh, 
definitively solved. So, yes. Right. So I I have uh, I have a, a question. Um, so I, as as you know, as I think many people know on this call, the space industry is historically risk averse and people tend to shy away from new algorithms and new uh, new navigation methods for fear that they won't work when we're in deep space. And sometimes I think that one of the most important aspects of a piece of new technology is not necessarily how well it works, but how reliably we know when it doesn't work. Uh, now, you mentioned in your work uh, measuring uh, and estimating the GDOP, uh, similar to how a uh, GPS receiver uh, would work. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the ability of your filter to accurately track and predict what the error will titer. Um, how accurately does your actual error fall within your covariance bounds? Uh, it's, excuse me, excuse me, Phil, but it was a uh, it, it it was an interrupted. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You, yeah. It, 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 did, did it break up? Yeah. So I guess really what I'm getting at is. How how well does your true error fall yeah. within the covariance bounds of your estimator? Oh yeah. So uh, first, I would say the in order to answer that, I need to get back to the what is the reference for any estimator. So uh, the, the, these are nonlinear estimators, and the, in the space industry, we are very familiar with the extended because we it's reliable for the engineers, but it's easy for them because they know how to tune it, how how to uh, ensure that the convergence of the filter and the consistency and so on. So to, to answer your question, uh, the goal, yes, is, to, is, is that the filter will perform well and will stay in the band, in, uh, will stay under the, 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 the upper band of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the covariance so that the system first uh, be, becomes always uh, stable. And at the same time, we ensure the, the convergence of the, of the, of the estimator. But uh, to, to, have, to have a clear answer is uh, we are working on it in, in parallel is to develop a tighter, tighter bond, which could be a kind of a key parameter uh, that engineers could use. For example, if tomorrow I will present uh, this system uh, for, for, uh, for a future space mission, and then the same question will arise. So I will be able to show you the, the tighter bond, which is the real lower bound for this nonlinear estimation problem affected by colored noise and non-Gaussian noise so that I can prove and demonstrate that my estimator is always, always converging to that lower bound. So th this is the way I see, uh, uh, this is the way I see how to, how to answer your question, but more than that, how to solve this, uh, the, the, this problem that you, uh, that you exposed. Excellent, thank you very much. Yeah, All right. Are there uh, any other questions? I'm not seeing not seeing anything else show up. All right. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you, Hamza, uh, and the uh, and the great work you guys are doing um, at ETS. There. Thank thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so you very much. Uh, at this point, we will. Thank you. Uh, so I will now. I'm uh, the next presenter, so I can uh, introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, as as mentioned. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Ferguson. I am a uh, uh, associate professor of uh, uh, mechanical engineering at uh, University of Manitoba. I'm also the um, I, I'm also the uh, NSERC Magellan Aerospace Industrial Research Chair in uh, satellite engineering uh, at the University of Manitoba. And so uh, the presentation that I want to talk to you all about today is uh, about one of my passions that I sort of alluded to in, uh, in my previous question, and that is finding ways to make sure that the space technologies that we develop uh, have a clear path towards technology readiness um, and, and making sure that we have ways to link together the great research that's being done in journal articles and conferences like this one, finding ways to make sure that that gets into the hands of people in industry in a way that's useful to them. And uh, you know, I think uh, Canada in general has done a really good job of finding pathways towards technology development. The Canadian Space Agency has done great things through its uh, 
uh, STDPs, the space technology development programs. Um, but I still think that there are gaps that exist, uh, particularly when it comes to guidance, navigation, and control algorithms. And, uh, and what we really need are better hardware in the loop simulation tools uh, that allow us to verify these uh, great guidance uh, algorithms that we're coming up with, fancy control algorithms. And uh, these challenges become harder and harder when we start thinking about environments that are further and further away from Earth. So one of the ways that we've looked uh, at, the, at my lab, the Space Technology and Advanced Research Laboratory or STAR Lab at the University of Manitoba, is we're looking to leverage drone technology to help us simulate uh, the dynamics that we expect to see in space and on other planets. And that's really what, uh, what this talk is about. So, you know, we're, uh, we're all quite familiar with uh, technology readiness levels. We, we, we talk a lot about these when we think about developing new technologies for space. You know, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're not familiar with these, uh, it's basically a TRL-1 or technology readiness level 1 is sort of as we progress up through these levels up to a, a finally mature level of TRL-9, uh, which represents actual spaceflight proven technologies, uh, we, we go through several different iterations that start with basic simulations and mathematics, and then moving towards more and more higher fidelity simulations and higher fidelity environments that we try the technologies out in. So one of the areas that I'm really targeting here with my research is how do we bridge that gap from about TRL-5 up to about TRL-8? And traditionally, this has been a really difficult area for people to cross because this is where we need to start trying out guidance, navigation, and control algorithms in real dynamic environments with real sensors and actuators. Um, and so there are ways to do this, obviously. Many of them are very expensive. Uh, you know, when we think about different kinds of testing environments, um, people have used neutral buoyancy before. We hear about a lot of people using uh, air bearings, both in a planar sense and in rotational sense. Um, people use uh, free fall towers, parabolic flights, sometimes sounding rockets. Uh, you know, the Black Brant sounding rocket that Magellan has developed has, uh, it, it continues to be a workhorse uh, in the scientific development environment. But of course, uh, if you are putting your technology on a sounding rocket and launching it uh, for a parabolic flight, then yeah, I mean, you're spending quite a bit of money also. Uh, when it comes to kinematics, you know, we have a number of different options there, robotic ma manipulators, Stuart platforms, uh, a, 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 other, other types of Cartesian systems. But, but the fact of the matter is that many of these are, are tricky. Um, and uh, they're, what they're trying to do is mimic dynamics that happen in space or on a different planet with different gravities, maybe different uh, air pressures, air frictions, air viscosities. Um, all of these things get very, very difficult when we're trying to counteract Earth's gravity and the kind of environment that we see here on our planet. So one of the things that, one of the ways that my lab is looking to counteract this is by using drones. So we've established a, a small uh, indoor test bed. And uh, this picture makes me laugh because th this picture was taken shortly after I took over this lab. And if you were to say, see the same picture right now, this area is surrounded by desks and benches and uh, people working on this uh, virtually every day now. But this was really when we conceived this uh, test bed uh, about a year and a half ago or two years ago. Uh, it, it's made up of uh, a number of different kinds of drones. We have drones that range from the very large uh, Matrice M600 drones down to some very tiny drones uh, that allow us to reprogram their autopilots. Um, at, the, at the heart of this test bed is an indoor tracking system by uh, Vicon. Uh, we have uh, six Vicon tracking cameras that uh, track little dots on our drones that give us uh, high frequency uh, position and orientation feedback of the drone to, to uh, uh, basically replace GPS because of course within the lab we don't have access to GPS signals. But really what it is that we want to do here, it's, it's one thing to just go ahead and fly drones in the lab and get position feedback and demonstrate great uh, control algorithms. But really what it is that we're trying to do is I want to make this drone or perhaps say a satellite hanging underneath the drone, I want it to feel like it's in a different environment than it actually is. And I want to use that drone platform to provide the vehicle that simulates the, the dynamics. 
Now, what, what makes this particularly tricky is the dynamics that I'm trying to simulate have to be by, by somewhat by definition, they need, they need to be feed forward. I need to be able to provide feed forward dynamic compensation that makes the drone now all of a sudden feel like, for instance, it's in microgravity. Or maybe we make the drone feel like it's in Martian gravity. Or maybe we make the drone feel like it's in the gravity of the moon Titan, but now we're also mimicking uh, air viscosity that is not present on Earth. So really what we're trying to do here is, is by flipping a switch and by designing whatever kind of dynamic environment we want, we can leverage the uh, now ubiquitous drone technology uh, to turn this into a hardware in the loop test bed for uh, spacecraft technologies. And so the way we do that is split up into three different areas. We have a drone dynamic compensator, which basically, for lack of a better word, keeps the shiny side up of our drone. Uh, it's a, a really a commercial autopilot. Wrapped around that commercial autopilot, we have our virtual dynamic engine that supplies the dynamics of our new environment. Now that dynamics could be microgravity. It could be the dynamics of say Hill's equations. If I want to look at relative motion between two different spacecraft, uh, or as I mentioned, it could be planetary dynamics. If I'm looking at the motion of say a drone as opposed to a satellite. And then, and then around all of that, we have a candidate controller. And this is our controller or possibly our estimators that we're interested in using. This can be any kind of a controller we want. Uh, in my lab right now, we're investigating the use of fractional controllers for highly nonlinear situations. We're looking at model predictive control for underactuated systems. Uh, we're looking at a number of different uh, scenarios all of which need to be demonstrated in a hardware in the loop test bed so that we can raise that technology readiness level up to an acceptable level. So just to walk through each one of these, uh, this is kind of what I've talked about already, that drone dynamic compensator. This basically sort of, I like to say, eliminates in some way, it eliminates the on earth drone dynamics and it provides us sufficient abstraction that allows us to then go and inject the virtual dynamics. So I, I'm not sure if many of you have uh, we're Mythbusters fans. I know I certainly was watching that show. And uh, I always used to love uh, the t-shirt the that one of the um, hosts used to wear that says, I reject your reality and substitute my own. And, and, and that, that's sort of the, the motto that we in my test bed um, uh, and my, my lab group live by. We're saying, yeah, we are going to reject the reality that is earth dynamics and replace that reality with a new kind of dynamics uh, that allows us to test these new um, controllers in, in, in different ways uh, using, using these, these candidate controllers that, that, we are, uh, that we're investigating. So now I, an interesting part of this test bed, uh, you know, pe people always say that uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And so, of course, you know, when, when, when you start trying to, in some senses, uh, cancel dynamics that are natural in an Earth-based environment, um, if you don't cancel them perfectly, you end up creating a much worse environment than, than what you actually started with. And so, so part of this challenge we learned very quickly is saying, well, gee, uh, if I want to cancel the dynamics of this drone and then replace them with some other kind of dynamics that makes the satellite that's attached to the drone uh, feel like it's experiencing a different environment, I need to know very, very intimately what the dynamics of that drone actually are. And so in order to do that, we've had to come up with some intelligent uh, system identification techniques that tell us the mass properties of the drone, the transfer functions of our uh, actuators, and the functioning of our sensors to make sure that we can do a very, very good job at eliminating those dynamics. Um, and, and to make matters even a little more complicated, it's one thing to do this with a single drone. It's another thing if you have drones that are working together and interacting. And you know, drones, as I had mentioned, are becoming quite ubiquitous these days and uh, they're, they're quite common to see. And so as you've, if you've ever been around a drone, in addition to them being sort of loud and annoying, they also generate a reasonable amount of wind. And so finding ways to compensate for that, also finding ways to ensure that the drone continues to behave in the same way, even as the battery starts to uh, decrease. These are all things that we're trying to capture with our system identification. And so uh, along those lines, I've uh, hired a number of graduate students that uh, are, are quite uh, experts in and not just system identification, but also with different kinds of optimization techniques. So what the approach that we've decided to use is known as a gray box approach, where we, um, where we assume a structure 
of our drone dynamics and then use the data that we collect to try to fill in some of those blanks. Uh, so some, some, some of the parameters, for instance, like I'd mentioned, those parameters could be the inertia, it could be the mass of the drone, it could be the, the, the moment arms of our motors, it could be the torque constants of the motors, it could be the pitch of the propellers. These are things that we're experimenting with right now. And the idea then is that we, we, we fly the drone in open loop, we measure the performance of the drone, and then over time, we put together an iterative um, uh, solver that uh, tries different values of the parameters that we're trying to optimize over and find the ones um, that, that, that fit the best. Now, you can certainly do this with manual trial and error, uh, but the ways that we have been exploring right now are using these, uh, and, and, and the one that we're focusing on right now is known as particle swarm optimization. And the, the idea here is that, um, what we're trying to do is find ways to prevent us from getting stuck in little local minima uh, when we do our, mac our, our uh, uh, optimization problem. And the way that particle swarm optimization works is that uh, we have a large uh, solution space. We continually pick um, random uh, starting points within our solution space, and we follow methods of, of steepest descent uh, to try to arrive at a uh, global minima. Um, these different points have mechanisms to communicate with one another, and so they, they tend to congregate on areas where, uh, where we have uh, global minima. That, that, that's, that's really what, what we're trying to do here. Now, as you can see in this little animation, uh, some of them do get stuck in some other little areas, but this ends up being sort of a consensus method. And so, and so using this method, we've been uh, playing around with this right now. These are not by any stretch. Uh, our final results. In fact, as I am speaking to you today, if, if you if you had looked at a previous version of this uh, schedule for today, it was originally going to be my master's student, uh, 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 Anand Yahyabadi, uh, giving this uh, this talk today. But he's now uh, in the lab uh, working on on this uh, on this challenge uh, as we speak. But basically, this eye chart is our latest and greatest, the last set of updates that I got from Amin while he's working on this. And and basically, what he's trying to do is uh, use a feed forward controller to eliminate uh, gravity on our drone. Uh, and that he's demonstrating the extent to which he's eliminated gravity by looking at what the closed loop position controller needs to do uh, in order to maintain a certain position. Now, in an ideal world, that should be nothing because it should just be a microgravity drone. And if it is indeed nothing, then we should be able to walk in with appropriate protective equipment uh, and poke the drone and have it float across our test bed which I, I can tell you right now works almost. <laughs> and I put almost in quotation marks. Uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's definitely a work in progress, but this is an area that, that we're focusing on right now. Uh, some of the next steps that we're looking into, I, I think are, are, are pretty exciting. We've got some other students that have recently been hired that are looking to extend this test bed. Uh, we're currently in the step of trying to evaluate the performer, for our performance and translational motion, uh, but we're also in the midst of a design project right now to design a new drone that will allow us to mimic rotational dynamics as well. Um, for those of you that have ever worked with a, a multi-rotor drone, a quadcopter, you'll, you'll know that uh, with only four rotors that don't rotate, that, that don't pitch themselves, uh, you only have four degrees of freedom. And of course, a drone moves in six degrees of freedom. We have three degrees of translational motion and three degrees of rotational motion. And uh, so what that means is that a drone is underactuated, and it means that you're unable, a, a normal drone is unable to maintain both a position and an attitude or an orientation uh, at the same time. And so what we're investigating now are multi-rotor drones where the rotors are positioned on pivots that will allow us to maintain a different attitude of the drone while at the same time maintaining a different position. And so what this should allow us to do is now start mimicking, instead of just translational motion, we can start to mimic rotational motion as well. And what we're investigating are ways in which we can make our satellite or drone feel like it has more inertia than it really does, uh, in addition to the viscous friction and, uh, and other aspects that I talked about before. And I also, uh, while, while I'm talking right now, I'm actually missing a, another meeting with another student group that is working to develop a test satellite platform that's intended to be mounted underneath our drones that will have uh, an array of typical spacecraft sensors and actuators like small reaction wheels, little sun sensors, a magnetometer, 
that will allow us to now start trying out our new control algorithms and our navigation algorithms while mounted under this drone that's providing the different kind of dynamic environment that we need to do a complete hardware in a loop test. Now, all of this, and this, this is where I get to plug some of my, my future research endeavors, but all of this really fits into a bigger picture uh, and, and a bigger um, uh, research endeavor, I guess I could call it, that, that I'm calling Drone Dome right now. And this is a proposal that I'm working on with many other uh, professors at the University of Manitoba and other colleagues at Magellan Aerospace, where we're looking to bolster the full line of technology development uh, test beds that we have available to us uh, right here in Manitoba, uh, which, which is quite interesting. So of course, we've been using numeric simulation for a very long time. Magellan Aerospace has a processor in the loop test bed that they've used for all of their recent uh, satellite missions, uh, SISAT, Cassiope, uh, RadarSat Constellation mission. And where we see this drone test bed fitting is sort of right after that point but right before we start providing real access to a space environment to start looking at things like radiation and other thermal uh, aspects of technology development. Uh, and now you might say drone dome, what's this dome part of it? And so this is a planned facility that we have for uh, the campus at the University of Manitoba. It would be a, a 72 foot by uh, a 110 foot uh, build, sorry, by a 310 foot building, uh, a fabric building, with a uh, 25 foot roof uh, instrumented with over 250 Vicon cameras that would make it the world's largest installation of indoor motion tracking cameras. Um, as you can see, uh, about a third of the facility would be dedicated to space simulations, both for uh, spacecraft uh, dynamic simulations, but also for uh, terrestrial, uh, extraterrestrial uh, simulations with rovers. Uh, and trying to find ways that rovers and spacecraft can work together to explore uh, a new planet. Uh, we're working with the civil engineering group at the University of Manitoba as well. They're building a mock bridge. We have mock transmission lines of people that want to use uh, drones for both bridge inspection and uh, transmission line inspections. And we're also working very closely with, um, with our engineers that do uh, river ice and sea ice research uh, throughout Manitoba. And uh, we, we have plans of maybe putting some small uh, uh, river channels within this, uh, within this building that we can allow them to ice up in our chilly Winnipeg winters and uh, use drones uh, for that purpose as well. So this, our idea here is that this drone dome can become a, a center of excellence for drone technology development, but a huge part of this will be focused towards space um, as well. So uh, I, as always, would like to thank the people that give us money and hope that they'll continue to give us money. That's uh, Magellan Aerospace, uh, NSERC, and of course the Canadian Space Agency for sponsoring my uh, industrial research chair and uh, my lab in general. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions here. And I can go back to the uh, chat window, I guess. Let me see here, chat. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, so, Question here from Rachel Lorza. Um, what are the most compelling benefits of using drones instead of a sixed off robot arms to simulate microgravity environments? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. So one of the problems, or actually I shouldn't say a problem, but one of the challenges that we have um, ahead of us is uh, trying to look at ways in which multiple spacecraft can interact together on a, on a larger scale. Uh, you know, that is certainly something that can be done with large uh, uh, robot arms. Uh, I know, you know, when I, I worked at uh, Spar Aerospace, which became MDA while I was working for them back in the late 90s, they had a, a really groundbreaking um, uh, test bed, their free flyer test bed that was looking at docking, docking systems with um, free flying spacecraft towards uh, one day doing on orbit uh, satellite uh, servicing. Um, and, and, and I know that testbed is still doing great things uh, to this day. Uh, th the problem with those test beds is it's difficult to scale. Um, you know, you maybe could have one or two, maybe three different spacecraft, but you're limited by the number of robot arms you can do. One of the reasons why we like thinking about drones here is that it scales rather easily with different numbers of drones. Uh, and uh, and, and we're, we, we think at least, or at least our initial signs seem to point to the, the flexibility that we get with drones uh, seems to be 
uh, a little bit greater than what we might have had with robot arms and, and maybe perhaps uh, a little less expensive as well. But I mean, it's a great point. There's many different ways to uh, skin this cat, so to speak. And uh, yeah, six DOF uh, uh, robot arms are, um, are, are a great option. Uh, next question here from Dan. Uh, are you planning to measure impacts and response of rovers and drones to impacts in your drone dome uh, test facility? Um, I, I, I don't really know what you mean by um, uh, impacts. Uh, uh, we, one of the things that we are looking at doing is looking at ways in which drones, rovers, and spacecraft can cooperate to surveil or explore a certain area of, uh, of a planet. So uh, very much along the same lines as what uh, uh, Hamza was talking about and our, our colleagues there from, e from ETS, uh, the, the great work that they're doing on guidance, navigation and control. We are looking at ways in which uh, the, those three different kinds of vehicles can communicate together to come up with good mechanisms for developing an understanding of where they are and how they are doing their, um, their navigation. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't think you mean physical impacts, like, like crashing, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, if, you, if you wouldn't mind clarifying the question just a little bit, I could maybe answer that a little more clearly. Uh, in the meantime, I'll, uh, I'll jump to Bayrod's question here. How do you envision your test bed to be able to mimic environmental disturbances like J2 magnetic torques? Uh, would the presence of a UAV work against what it's trying to mimic in some cases, electromagnetic interferences? Yeah, so, so great question. Um, I, I certainly know that there are many different kinds of disturbances that are at levels far, far, far below the noise uh, environment that we will create uh, with a drone. Uh, not the least of which, as you mentioned, are electromagnetic uh, disturbances, uh, but also wind disturbances as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I, I admit that it's an open question. Uh, it's an area that we're looking at right now. And, and what we're trying to evaluate right now is what is the smallest disturbance that we think we can actually uh, mimic with this drone test bed? And that's part of the reason why I have a master's student in the lab right now Trying to, trying to come up with a number for that. And, and I think it really comes down to how accurately are we able to simulate, or, or, or sorry, to, to identify our existing dynamics and uh, eliminate them. Because obviously if we could eliminate them perfectly, uh, then uh, we could get down to levels 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus eight Newton meters uh, that, that we would expect to see for magnetic disturbances, maybe atmospheric drag disturbances. And then when it comes to orbital disturbances like J2, we're starting to think about um, forces down in the micronewtons uh, and less. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think right now the, the jury's still out. I don't think we're going to get that low, but what I'd like to do is find ways in which we can, first of all, determine how low we can get and then find ways to scale the disturbances appropriately in ways that allow us to do meaningful technology development, even if I have to over-exaggerate what some of these uh, disturbances actually are uh, to develop the technologies. So yeah, uh, great, great question, very on point. And it's, uh, it's one of the things that my master's student is investigating as we speak. So th this is very much a work in progress. And, uh, but we're, we're very excited about it. And uh, it's, it, it's uh, I know Magellan is excited about it as well as my industrial partner. And uh, so is the Canadian Space Agency as, uh, as we ramp up our exploration efforts um, in the future. A uh, question here from Warren. So uh, what is the expected maximum carrying weight for the drone? What is the size of the satellite test platform? Yeah, great, great question. So the, the students that are developing the satellite test platform right now, I'm, I'm pleased to say they're, um, it's part of the capstone design uh, course that goes on in, as part of the electrical engineering department at uh, University of Manitoba, where they build up a system. And so I, uh, as we all know, aerospace engineering is a highly multi multidisciplinary field. And even though I fall under the mechanical engineering umbrella, I tend to work uh, across all disciplines of engineering, including civil, electrical, mechanical, and even sometimes uh, biosystems as well. Um, so I currently have the electrical engineering uh, capstone students working on this test platform. I've given them a uh, three to five kilogram uh, target for their, um, for their satellite. Uh, three is their requirement, five is their stretch goal. 
uh, if they if they if 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 they can uh, uh, well sorry the other way around F five is their target three is the stretch goal but then on the on the flip side uh, the drone that we're developing right now we're developing it to be able to carry up to six uh, kilograms and conduct tests up to about twenty to thirty minutes at that uh, at that weight. So as you can imagine, this drone is going to be relatively large. It's probably going to be the size of about a Matrice M600. If you've seen these, these are the ones that people use in the film industry. Uh, we are very rapidly going to outgrow my little indoor lab environment. Uh, and it gets more and more terrifying the larger drones are that we use inside this little netted area. And all the more reason why we want to move to our uh, drone dome facility that hopefully we can break ground on next spring uh, funding uh, pending. <laughs> so yeah, good, great question, but that, that's really what we're targeting. What I'd, what I'd really like to be able to do is to be able to basically strap a 3U CubeSat underneath my drone and have it behave as if it was actually in space. That's, that, that's the pipe dream. And uh, that, that's really what we're after with this test. But. All right, uh, anything else? Uh, okay, changing way of asking the question. Thanks, Dan. Sorry about that. Um, are you planning to measure dynamics and responses to subparts mechanisms of rovers, i.e., robotic arm uh, and receive? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, actually. Um, and and it, it's a great it's a great question because some of the things that we are looking at is trying to understand say deployment dynamics. Uh, I just had a meeting with my CubeSat team. We're part of the Canadian CubeSat program sponsored by the Canadian Space Agency, and we're in the midst of getting ready for our critical design review and thinking about our deployment mechanisms. And, and, and uh, of course we have questions like, well, what's, what's gonna happen to the spacecraft when we flop out our solar panels? Or what's gonna happen when we uncoil a, uh, a uh, um, uh, antenna or something that comes out? Is that really gonna mess with our, with our dynamics? And of course we can simulate that in MATLAB, but uh, it's one thing to simulate it. It's another thing to actually try it out in real hardware. So, so yes, this is one of the purposes of this test bed is to try to allow us to deploy mechanisms, have other things moving on the spacecraft and have the spacecraft respond in a way that would be representative of it on orbit. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a great question and, it, and it's one of, it was one of the driving factors for creating this test bed in the first place. That's a great question. Thanks, Dan. All right, so if there's uh, nothing else, then I, I guess I uh, have the double duty here to finish up my presentation and then thank you uh, to everybody. Oh, sorry, there, there's one last question here from Hamza. Uh, do you expect to use your drone dome to prepare for future flight missions on other planets? Uh, uh, analyze inertial aerodynamics under different gravity fields. The answer is a resounding yes. And uh, it's one of the reasons, Hamza, why I was so excited to hear your talk and your colleagues talk from ETS. And actually, while both of you were talking, I was emailing my graduate students saying, you need to look up the research that they're doing because this is right along the lines of what uh, we're trying to do and what we want to do with our drone dome. So I would love to have a conversation with you and your colleagues, Hamza, uh, in the future about my finding ways that we can collaborate to make use of this facility uh, once we have it built. So yes, absolutely, we'd like to turn to collaborate on that. All right, well, Jeff, I guess I can turn it over to you if you have some uh, closing remarks. Oh, all right, Phil. Um, <laughs> well, we've run a little bit long and uh, I think that's a strong indication of the interest that those of us uh, who are on the line and enjoying these presentations have in the topic of guidance, navigation and control. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, about aspects of the science and engineering that take place close to the ground, even on the ground, um, in terms of developing techniques. And as Phil was talking about, uh, going from technology readiness level low to high and how that takes place. Um, but when you're out, let's say, uh, you know, millions of miles in space, it really becomes quite a different, uh, quite a different problem. Um, so on behalf of, of Cassie and everybody in the audience, uh, it's my duty and my pleasant duty to thank uh, Mozen Rostami, Abul Asad El Gamudi, and Hamza Benzaruk, and our moderator Phil Ferguson for sharing their research with you today on issues related to GNC in the space arena. This has been the third in the Cassie Astro 2020 virtual series, 
of events. Um, it, it seems like um, the draw, of course, the obvious drawback to virtual events is you're not in the presence of others. You don't have the chance to to develop and, and take advantage of the spontaneity that happens when you're with each other. But it does enable people to participate at arm's length in activities and events that otherwise might be out of their reach. So I'm glad we've been able to accommodate all of you today. Um, some of you might not have even had the opportunity to attend ASTRO uh, in June in Toronto. So uh, glad you could make it. Um, next up in our series of uh, ASTRO uh, virtual events is a three and a half hour workshop on space domain awareness. This is going to be led by Defense Research and Development Canada, our colleagues there. And it's going to be a three and a half hour event. Uh, it's starting at one o'clock next Thursday afternoon, November 5th. And it'll go until, well, I guess I should say at least 4.30. Um, the week following that will be a workshop. There, sorry, uh, the week following the workshop will be a more regular uh, technical session with a slightly different focus, although, although in the same area uh, called space situational awareness. Generally, many of the same ideas, but uh, some different uh, aspects involved there. <clears throat> Additional events in the advanced planning stages are sessions on CubeSats, Earth observation, planetary science and surface exploration, and space exploration. So I'd invite you to stay tuned for those. And we do have a couple of other events that I can't talk about too much yet, but I would like to take the wraps off of them uh, very soon that uh, I think um, will be of, of broader interest to the Canadian space community. And so I would ask that you visit the website every now and then just to keep yourselves abreast. And if you'd like us to reach out to you and to give you the, the sort of the push notifications, uh, make sure that we know that. Um, you can let us know by email or by um by becoming members, go crazy, knock yourself out. We'd love to have you as members of, of Cassie if you're not already. So uh, finally, thank you once again for your attendance. Um, I would also like to gratefully acknowledge the support of my Cassie headquarters colleagues, April Duffy and Todd Legault, who are handling the logistics for our virtual series and for most of what we do um, as an institute. So until we cross paths again, please stay safe, be patient, and goodbye for now. Checking out.